So good evening, everybody. Uh, so sorry about the technical details. Uh, so um, dear Mr. President of the Danone Institute International, the Olivier, dear Madam President of the 2018 um, Danone in, uh, International Prize on Alimentation, dear Suzanne, and dear uh, Chief Officer of Alimentation Science at Danone, dear Nicola. Um, thank you very much for your kind words. I am uh, very honored today to be receiving this prize and uh, also very delighted to be able to give this lecture on my work uh, regarding childhood eating behavior, its um, uh, influencing periods and uh, the factors that uh, influence it. So um, this is the outline of my presentation. I will uh, uh, mention the work that I did that uh, supports the idea that uh, it's very important to uh, consider healthy eating from the start of life. And then I will move to the work showing that the first steps toward healthy eating in children. And uh, finally moving to our research, more recent research showing how we can encourage children to think of healthy food as happy foods. But first I will start by a few words on alimentation. So you may wonder what this word means. And uh, Olivier tried to explain this. And uh, in fact, it's not easy because it's a French word. For the non-French speakers in this audience, I'm not sure this word has a lot of meaning to you. So uh, it's actually uh, very hard to translate. And I tried that uh, on a lot of occasions in my career and never achieved this. So I will start uh, by uh, giving you examples of what it is not. So for me, alimentation is not about this kind of product, which may be balanced in terms of nutritional content, but wholly lacking in all other aspects. So my vision of alimentation is uh, illustrated on this picture. Alimentation is about nutrition, of course, because the first function of eating is to uh, sustain our nutritional needs. So that's the fruit in this picture. But alimentation is also about pleasure, and that the cake uh, under the fruit and the candle that goes on top. Alimentation is also about socializing and sharing moments, enjoying time and eating together. And uh, on this picture, it was the birthday party of my mother. And finally, alimentation is also about identity. Our food choices define who we are. And uh, this can relate to our culture, our religion, our, our own beliefs about foods. And in this case, I chose to prepare strawberry pie because it's my mom's favorite fruit. So alimentation really relates to all these functions of eating, nutrition, pleasure, socialization, and eating. And here I propose that it is only by taking conjunctly these four dimensions into account that we can make progress towards healthy eating and not by focusing on nutrition alone. Now a few words of context about uh, uh, alimentation in children. So as uh, you may all well be aware, uh, childhood obesity is increasing worldwide, and the global number of children with the overweight of, of obesity is still increasing in many countries, although it may start stabilizing in some, in some places. Childhood obesity is associated with uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, and uh, also psychological impairment, including low self-esteem. So this is a very important stake in many countries, and France is no exception. In this context, uh, the World Health Organization has issued uh, documents and prioritized actions to put an end to childhood obesity. And among these actions, uh, two uh, are related to some of the work I, I have been conducting, looking at early childhood diet and promotion of intake of healthy foods. So you may think that France is a paradise for healthy eating, but it is not the case for all children, and that these uh, topics are relevant in France too. And this is why I was interested in this area of research. So healthy eating, how can we define healthy eating? Well, we could have a whole day workshop on this question and still not manage to come to a conclusion. So I will uh, simply, uh, for my purposes here, uh, define it in terms of choice. Uh, healthy eating is about choosing healthy food, which are generally low in energy density, and it's also about the amount that we eat. 
So, um, unfortunately, the consumption of healthy foods, such as fruits and vegetables, is below the recommended amount in many countries, as nicely illustrated here. So, <laughs> what is generally done about that is public health campaign that focus on healthy eating, that promotes uh, or try to find ways to increase children's nutritional knowledge about uh, foods. But the effect of uh, health promotion messages is at best limited. In France, the government body, the National Program on Nutrition and Health, disseminates also um, health-oriented messages to the population. So children grow in a context where the health value of food is emphasized. And here, I propose that it is not uh, an efficient strategy. So really, uh, what uh, earlier research has shown and from the uh, late Jane Wardle, is that the same new drink labeled as good for health is rated as less liked by school-aged children. And further research by Michelle Mamoran has also shown that a cracker that was labeled that make you strong was less liked and less consumed by preschool-aged children. So despite being full of good intentions, associating food with health value is creating an unwanted expectation that if a food is good for health, it can't have a good taste, which is really unfortunate. So what we can do about that? We, what we really want to achieve is that children find healthy food enjoyable to eat. And we need to find the correct way in this direction. So this is where my research um, starts. Um, I um, did some previous work showing uh, how uh, early food preference track into later life, and I chose to illustrate this by work of the Italian artist Giuseppe Penone, which shows in a striking way how early mark can um, uh, prolong in the existence of, uh, of one person, or here one tree. So we, in the recent years, we learned a lot about the importance of metabolic programming uh, for the determination of uh, one's health. And in particular, we learned about the importance of the first thousand days of life for creating health status for life. And my research has focused on trying to understand the programming of eating behavior, behavior during this period from conception to a child's second birthday. This is a period of intense evolution in the mode of feeding because the, child will, uh, the, the feeding method will change from the umbilical cord during pregnancy to milk feeding in the first uh, months of postnatal life, whether it is breastfeeding or formula feeding, to complementary feeding by the midpoint of the first year until the child finally reaches a family table and uh, eat, eat alongside these families. So this is a, uh, bef happening before the development of food neophobia, which has a uh, developmental component uh, that starts to emerge, develop around age two, and which may level off around age eight. So during the first thousand days of life, major transition happen in the mode of feeding, and uh, this is when the child learns to eat. In my uh, very first uh, work, uh, we looked at uh, food choices in children right after this period, and uh, thanks to the collaboration with the wonderful uh, Dr. Vincent Baudieu, who gave me access to uh, all the research notes he took uh, during uh, nursery meals, um, I could uh, analyze the food choices of those children in what was like a free choice cafeteria for, for nursery school. And analyzing those data helped to show that the variety of children, of the food choices children made themselves in this cafeteria was decreasing over the third year, revealing that by, during this period, children were able to identify their favorite food and to make their own choices accordingly. By tracking those children until their 20s, we showed that the children who chose vegetables most frequently at age two to three consumed a wider variety of vegetables through their childhood up to early adulthood uh, and, to, and to, to age uh, 22. So finally, um, all these results uh, showing the tracking of eating behavior in early life really drove me to focus on understanding the early development of uh, eating behavior, trying to understand how children learn to eat in these various aspects that are listed here. 
But I have to say, I still don't have all the answers to these questions yet, but I'm working out on it, and I hope uh, that uh, I can achieve more in this area. But um, so I will now show the results that show the first steps toward healthy eating that we have achieved to uh, obtain. And what I can say for sure, that it is never too early to eat healthily. So start early. So this uh, research was organized according to uh, three topics. Uh, when to start complementary feeding, how to introduce complementary food, and each which, in which way should children be fed. So for the in interests of time today, I will not present all the research detail, but uh, I will directly jump to the conclusions, so towards uh, recommendations we can make uh, in this uh, regard. So uh, the French Ministry of Health is currently revising a recommendation for uh, feeding children aged two to three. And um, this is uh, the piece of uh, research that I showed to the committee that is in charge of, of uh, writing up these uh, recommendations. So research that was conducted in my group and in other groups showed that several modifiable factors impact the acceptance of new foods at the beginning of complementary feeding. There is a window of opportunity to introduce healthy foods such as fruits and vegetables before four to 24 years, uh, 24 months. Not before, because before that age, uh, the uh, digestive systems of the infant is not uh, ready to accept new food, and not after, because that's when food neophobia starts to develop. Nevertheless, uh, before the start of complementary feeding, breastfeeding provides an opportunity for learning about uh, flavors of food from the mother's diet, and that will uh, ultimately uh, impact acceptance of new food at the beginning of complementary feeding. At, at the age of four months, uh, flavors of a variety of food can start to be introduced and texture after six months. This uh, stage in life is a, an opportunity for parents to provide repeated exposures and opportunities for the child to learn about food before the parents decide that the child don't like it. It is also a period where the variety of uh, exposure to flavors, taste, and texture will make an impact on the acceptance of new foods. During this period, uh, parental, parental feeding styles are also important, and the authoritative uh, feeding style, which is uh, accompanied by um, reasonable demands from the parents and uh, sensitivity to child's need, is associated to the healthiest diet in children, and responsive feeding is also important to uh, avoid overeating. And all this should go along in parallel of um, making sure that the child is growing and developing normally. So these conclusions are based on uh, multiple research showing the factors influencing uh, food acceptance at weaning. Uh, for instance, uh, previous breastfeeding experience, adapting the sensory properties of complementary foods to make sure that they are palatable enough for children, repeating exposure to foods, and varying the fur early enough. So the first experience is about food, uh, derived from uh, the exposure of children to uh, flavors the mother has eaten in utero or in lacto. And uh, in this area of research, I want to acknowledge the pioneering work of Julie Menela at Monell Chemical Sciences Center and of Benoit Schell in my uh, research institute, who have uh, really both been uh, inspirations to me. And uh, in this area, I also had the pleasure of working with uh, Eileen Ausner at the University of Copenhagen to look at uh, influence, early influences on uh, f uh, acceptance of new foods. Uh, given my background in sensory science and to, give, to get a better understanding of uh, the development of uh, uh, senses uh, in, in the first years, I developed also a lot of research trying to understand uh, sensory development in children during the first years. So um, we set up a cohort in Dijon named Opaline in order to understand the development of some senses. And with my uh, past student and uh, current colleague, uh, Camille Schwartz, we looked at the development of taste acceptance over the first two years. And uh, we showed uh, how this uh, acceptance, acceptance for a variety of tastes evolved during this period, how it is influenced by our previous feeding experience, and how it can in turn uh, predict the acceptance of uh, tasty foods later on. 
In my research group, my colleagues uh, Sandrine monry patrice and Sylvie Sanchou worked on the acceptance of odor, um, odors uh, in the same cohort, and they showed in particular the development of avoidance behavior toward unpleasant food odors uh, during the first two years. And uh, in a joint approach, we were also interested in looking at how uh, food neophobia could be influenced by reactions to tastes or odors. And we actually showed that neophobia was associated with uh, preference or re reactivity to odors, but not to tastes. And uh, finally, uh, with my colleague Carole Tournier, we were also interested in looking at the development of uh, oral abilities in children to process uh, texture of food. And this is an area where children are really uh, growing and evolving very rapidly during the course of the first years. So uh, they develop the ability to uh, process uh, food with uh, evolving textures. And we actually also looked at uh, the acceptance or evolution of acceptance of food with a variety of textures from the age of six to 18 months. Uh, what we found was that um, some textures like uh, pieces were easy to, soft pieces were easy to introduce right from the start, but for raw pieces or hard food, children needed to develop their abilities to uh, process those foods. Uh, we were also interested in trying to understand the first reactions to new food during this uh, very early uh, complementary feeding period. And uh, looking, at, looking back at the uh, data recollected in the Opaline cohort, we looked at reactions between five and seven months. And what we found was that overall, most reactions to new foods were very positive uh, overall. So there is no neophobia or pickiness at the start of complementary feeding. And so that's good news, so we can start uh, providing healthy food from the start. And the reactions until the age of 15 months were still very positive, although we saw a little uh, drop in the acceptance of fruits or vegetables, which may just be the start of a, a later drop in acceptance of those foods. We also showed that uh, the acceptance of vegetables was higher when they were offered at five rather than at six months, which again, uh, reveals the importance of uh, starting to introduce those foods early. The last point I want to touch on in this area is the importance of uh, early variety uh, right from the start of complementary feeding. So in this field also, I want to acknowledge the work of uh, Julie Minella, uh, whom, who I had the pleasure to work with uh, when at Monel on the uh, factors and the, the importance of eating a variety diet from the start of complementary feeding. So overall, these uh, studies show that it's very important to promote um, a variety of, or to, to expose children to a variety of food because it promotes the acceptance and help the child to adapt to new food they don't know. Now moving to the, uh, this new, new part of uh, my research and uh, question that are at the core of my uh, current, uh, current work. Um, I'm really, I really want to encourage children to think of healthy food as happy food. And I'm sure that the parents in this audience will uh, recognize the challenge it represents. So let me return to the notion of pleasure. So pleasure of eating is at the core of our food choices. Um, pleasure is, uh, the search for pleasure is guiding our food choices and experienced pleasure is reinforcing our food likes. With my uh, colleagues, uh, Sandrine monry patrice Stéphanie Chambaron, and Lucille Marty, we uh, recently mapped uh, pleasure of eating into three dimensions, the sensory pleasure, interpersonal pleasure, and cognitive pleasure. So regarding sensory pleasure, I already explained how it comes from uh, early exposure to food during the first stages of life. I just want to add here uh, that uh, not only do our senses contribute to the, our aesthetic uh, appreciation of food, but they also make it possible to identify and remember food by detecting flavors and energy density and associating them in memory. And this is work I conducted in um, infants and in school-age children, in particular with uh, Eloise Remy, former post, uh, PhD student, which really highlights the importance of uh, uh, and, and the uh, ability of our uh, brain system to integrate those signals. In this area, I was also very much inspired by the work of uh, Professor Leanne Birch and Professor Barbara Rawls 
at uh, Penn State, but uh, I think that nevertheless, given the ever-changing uh, uh, food environment in which we live, we still need more research in this area to really understand how sensory signal can drive eating behavior uh, in an immediate way and to understand or design food that can help guide eating, healthy eating behavior in a sustainable, sustainable way. So more is to be done in this, in this area. Concerning interpersonal pleasure, uh, there's a social context of eating, and it's, eating is a social experience for the child as they depend on caregiver to eat. Uh, social learning will guide what and how much children eat, and this starts very early on. For instance, the work, the work by Professor uh, Julie Lumeng showed that uh, infants drink more formula in the presence of social interactions. And um, the social context of eating has a profound effect on our food choices. Uh, eating with uh, other people uh, provides the opportunity to share the same food, and this provides the uh, opportunity for repeated exposure to affect liking. Through visual imitation, children can learn how and what to eat, and uh, uh, conversation at the dinner table uh, can also sustain and redefine likes and dislikes during uh, eating. And finally, this creates a context for emotional perversion to happen and to um, uh, help the child to uh, uh, increase liking for healthy foods. So pleasure of eating is partly constructed by interactions with others and socially produced. So uh, for some of you, this may uh, seem to be a way of eating à la française, but in fact, I don't see why this wouldn't be applicable in other parts of the world except, of course, if children are eating by themselves and are not benefiting from the company of others. Then moving to the cognitive dimension of pleasure. We have to recognize the cognitive processes that can modulate pleasure from eating. And as the late French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss was saying, food are chosen not only because they are good to eat, but also because they are good to think. Food have to be good to think. I think it's very important. So um, this idea was uh, largely exploited by um, uh, food companies to market food to children. By building expectations about a specific food, this can influence children's enjoyment of that food. So unfortunately, this uh, generally concerns unhealthy food. But I think we have to find ways to promote the consumption of healthy foods as an important strategy to support healthy eating among children and young people. So I just wonder who will do that, and I think that maybe we have to uh, roll up our own sleeves uh, to achieve this. So what we did is in this area, uh, inspired by the work on uh, nudging, that shows uh, how we can make uh, subtle differences in the environment to uh, uh, trigger healthy choices. We were interested, interested in looking at how we could trigger mental representation of healthy food through modification of the environment. So in, in this experiment, we used an olfactory prime, uh, which was uh, presented in the um, headset of the, or the foam of the headset children were using during uh, uh, a food choice task, uh, computer food choice task, sorry. Uh, this research was conducted on children with normal weight and with uh, overweight and obesity, and the results were different in these two targets. In uh, normal weight children, the presence of the olfactory primes, which were of a healthy food or of an unhealthy food, they both reduce the number of healthy food choices that they make in the computer task. On the contrary, in uh, children with obesity, we found that the healthy odor prime was actually associated with a higher number of healthy food choices, where the, uh, the other uh, prime did not change uh, choices. So this revealed different cognitive processes around food in uh, overweight, uh, children with uh, overweight and obesity and in normal weight children, as was also shown in adults. Which, and it, this should also drive us to uh, thinking more about uh, modification of the environment uh, that can uh, alter children's food choices. 
To move forward, we also looked at children's attitude toward food and developed a method to characterize them into um, uh, health-oriented attitudes or nutrition-oriented attitudes or pleasure-oriented attitudes. Then we asked children to come to the lab and make choices for an afternoon snack by choosing five plates among 20, uh, 10 with energy-dense foods and 10 with healthy foods. What we found was that uh, children with high nutritional attitudes chose fewer healthy food, or in other words, the children with high pleasure-oriented attitudes choose, choose more healthy foods. So in this, in this case, pleasure was promoting healthy food choices. Again, food for thought. So how can we trigger uh, pleasure of eating and uh, make it a, a powerful tool to increase uh, healthy food choices? In another experiment using the same uh, food choice task, we asked children to choose uh, five plates among 20, four specific contexts, a nutrition class, and a birthday party. Uh, as expected, the results showed that social context modulated their choices and that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, children can make healthy choices at no inordinate cost in this situation that is, uh, that the liking of the, food of the food they choose for the nutrition class and for the birthday party was uh, similar. So this reveals that uh, children are knowledgeable about foods and that when they are provided a fair competition, that is, a competition between food they like, they are able to make healthy choices. So this is uh, important uh, food for thought for the future. Finally, moving to the question of uh, eat an amount, uh, we were wondering about how to promote the pleasure to eat small portion size. And is it in this area, I was uh, very much inspired by the work of uh, Pierre Chandon and Yann Cornille, uh, who work in marketing, and who propose that pleasure could be a substitute for size in terms of healthy eating. So because of uh, sensory-specific satiation, they propose that um, the experienced pleasure during the act of eating could be maximized overall for smaller portion size because pleasure decreases during the course of uh, consumption of large portion size. So overall, uh, small portion size could provide overall a greater satisfaction uh, for, to be satiated. So as a follow-up of this study, uh, we developed work with uh, Pierre Chandon to look at how we could promote a healthy uh, portion size uh, choice in children uh, in, uh, by uh, proposing a sensory imagery condition in which we ask children to make choices for, uh, to imagine, sorry, uh, the uh, sensory inputs they receive while eating. And in the control condition, they had to think about sensory inputs, but um, not related to foods. Then they had to choose between uh, three portions of uh, either a chocolate brownie on one day or applesauce on the other day. And this was uh, counterbalanced. Uh, what we found was that uh, children choose a dome-sized portion uh, for brownie, but not for applesauce. So in the sensory imagery condition, so really thinking about the pleasure they would receive from food helped them to make a, a choice for a smaller portion size, which again um, is uh, very interesting for future research. And uh, we need to replicate this finding and to uh, look at the long-term sustainability of the sensory imagery uh, condition and see whether it could be an area for helping children to make healthy choices. So, we learned a lot about uh, pleasure of eating healthy food, but uh, now we need to understand how to put this uh, information in practice. And uh, I started myself in a very casual way for the birthday party of my son, where I decided to propose two cakes uh, for the, the children. One cake which was um, a chocolate birthday cake, and the other cake which was a fruit birthday cake. In fact, it was not a cake, it was just a pile of fruits. And the data were very easy to collect. All the children wanted both and ate both cakes. And I have to say they, they choose a big portion of uh, chocolate cake, but there were leftovers. So next time I will guide them to smaller portions. So there is certainly a way uh, in which we can uh, help children make uh, healthy choices. And uh, we still need to research more and uh, to make sure we can make an impact on the uh, daily lives of children. 
So this is my last part, how we can bridge the gap between research and society, and this is a huge task. Uh, so how we can go from uh, research in the lab, where everything is nicely controlled and uh, very uh, easy to do in a way, to uh, real life, for instance, uh, nursery school catering, uh, where children live to get, uh, eat together, or everyday eating occasion where children have uh, uh, to make food choices. So thanks to the DIPA International Prize on Alimentation, I hope I can make progress in this direction. And uh, I have uh, two ideas in mind, uh, empowering children to make healthy choices whenever possible, and really uh, making, them, uh, making sure that for them, healthy choice is the happy choice. And also empowering parents uh, for a healthy start regarding feeding practices and healthy eating habits. So we know a lot in this area, but still, uh, so much counterproductive practices are part of the daily routine that I think we have a long way to go before we can make sure we made progress. So I really want to work uh, in this direction. Uh, finally, the DIPA Prize will also help me to uh, answer those questions. Uh, how can we, we can help uh, school-aged children to include new foods in their repertoire? So with new foods, I don't necessarily mean... Uh, food from uh, highly processed food, but uh, we're currently running a case study on vegetable protein-based dishes uh, in uh, school milk catering in, uh, in Dijon. As you know, in France, we eat a lot of meat, and we really need to uh, change our diets to a more sustainable uh, diet, including more um, vegetable protein. And so uh, this is a, a point of this experiment, and we hope to identify a method that could be replicated with other foods and in other contexts. And I also wonder whether the use of uh, participatory research techniques with children can help uh, reach our goals more easily by starting from children's perceptions and children's beliefs about foods. So this will be uh, maybe the topic of another presentation in the future. Uh, for now, I really want to acknowledge the work of my uh, wonderful colleagues in Dijon, uh, all my uh, collaborators. As uh, those of you who, know, who work with children, you know how both uh, satisfying and time-consuming it is. So I couldn't have presented some of the studies I showed today uh, without their inputs, uh, great inputs and feedback. So I really want to thank them. Uh, in particular, uh, collaborators from my team, Sylvie Sanchou, who has always been a great support, Camille Schwartz, uh, Sandrine Monry patrice Stéphanie Chambaron, Emily Slepper, Valérie Feyen, and the others. I want also to acknowledge the work by uh, Christine Lange and Carole Tournier, and uh, the work of the doctoral students I uh, personally supervised, uh, Camille Schwartz, Sophia Boulal, Eloise Rémy, Camille Diver, Wenling Yuan, Lauriane de Montel, Lucie Marty, and Marie Bournez. And I want to thank again the uh, Danone International Prize for Alimentation Committee for awarding me this prize. Uh, this is a great honor, and I'm, I'm very happy about that. And uh, my last words will be for the children and their parents who participated in my research. So this is just a little part of the Opaline family. So I really want to thank them all and thank also all the other children and parents who participated in my research. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, Sophie, thank you very much for this very brilliant presentation. It's my pleasure to deliver to you this diploma as a first awarded uh, person for the very new Danone Institute Prize for Alimentation. I hope the audience did understand what is the alimentation tonight. And I wish you a good evening and Thank you again, and congratulations to Sophie.